In other words, if something has spoken to you, give it the time of day. Spend time with it, look at it, observe it, feel it. Try and even figure out why it's affecting you the way it is. So what you're doing is you're not just taking something from it. It's, it's like making a relationship. And that's how I think creating most of my photographs is. Freeman Patterson has been taking nature photographs for almost 50 years and has accumulated nearly every major award and recognition Canada has to offer. He's written four instructional books on photography, published four large coffee table books of his work, and has given photography workshops for years in Canada and Southern Africa. We met Freeman Patterson at his home in Champers Bluff, New Brunswick. Freeman, I wanted to uh, start by asking a little bit about the place that we're sitting in, this, this house of yours this, with this gorgeous view and, and this beautiful house. Was your parents' farm originally, is that right? No, my parents' farm was five kilometers down the road. Oh, it was, okay. But my father bought this piece of property, and I bought an adjoining piece of property. And uh, when I moved from Toronto a long time ago, <laughs> when I came home again, uh, this is where I settled. Okay. Yeah. But you were a kid here, were you? I was a kid here, just uh, five k's down the road, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really the only child of my age uh, for a good many years. There were just no other kids born around the time I was. So, what was that like? Well, my best friends were the were the forests. I mean, you know the the ferns and the and the great big boulders and the in the woods and the pebbles and the birds on the beaches of the St. John River and things like that. So I was very attuned to the natural world. It yeah. was just natural. Yeah. You know. I, it's interesting because in all the things that I have read about you over the years, you, you often will talk about your parents and the influence they had on you. And the influence of your mother mm -hmm. was considerably different than the influence of your father. Sure. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, my dad was a farmer, and it was a mixed farm, dairy and other animals, and then we grew fruit and, and vegetables. So in his worldview, or his farm view anyway, uh, something was useful if you could grow it to eat primarily, or maybe you could grow it to wear. And anything not related to that was a frill pretty well. So he had no time for things like flowers. Even though he raised bees, uh, flowers were a waste of time. And my mother, who was a nurse born in St. John and made the big mistake of marrying a farmer and came here. And she worked really hard. She worked so hard that she had no opportunity to satisfy her own aesthetic instincts other than to grow flowers on the windowsill of the living room and the dining room. But... Uh, I would say every now and then, like a November day, uh, a Sunday, if she had a little time off, she'd take my sister and I for me for a walk uh, along a country road. And in the course of that walk, a walk would point out things like the curving of grasses, the brown grasses, that, and she'd make us listen to the wind blowing through the grasses. And... Um, and then, for example, I remember she would do things like pointing out a flock of snowbirds in the grain field near the house and then say, now you watch those because when they take off, they're go there's going to be a flash of light off their wings. And so we'd sit there and we'd watch. And sure enough, the birds would take off and it would be that momentary flash. Well, what she was in effect saying was, these things are important. You know, the sound of the breeze blowing through dry grasses is something to pay attention to. And, you know, all of these years later, I realized that it was because of that that uh, I've had the life I've had. Yeah. Um, tell me, about, well, when did photography first come into it all for you? It's a little difficult to answer. Yeah. I did a few photographs when I was, oh, maybe in grade school. I didn't have enough money. I remember I bought... Had a little, I was given a little box brownie or whatever it was, and I could afford maybe, before I stopped, six or seven films, which were black and white and sent off somewhere to be processed. 
and ten days later you'd get the prints back. And I was photographing things like snow banks and up against the windows of, of the house and so on. And then that went away until I was in my third year of university when I, um, when I had a scholarship to spend the summer in what was then Yugoslavia. And I took a camera with me. And right away I realized I had a tool that I loved working with, even though it was defective and I didn't make any photographs. I had a wonderful yes, you time. Came back for, you came back at the end of that summer and everything was lost, right? That's right. I'd made 1,500 non-existent <laughs> photographs. <laughs> yeah. And yet you persevered. I well, was, I think it, for most people would go, oh, well, the hell with this. No, but I, was, <laughs> I went back another year at, at Acadia University, and, and I, I kept making photographs there, and, and, and I just got more and more interested in it. Yeah. Was it, at any point during that, those formative years, did the thought of, of um, non-photographic visual art, like painting, was that ever a possibility for you? No. Now, one of the things you see growing up on the farm, I mean, really, the arts were not a part of our background okay. at all. all right. Um, I was encouraged to read, and I loved reading, and I was given books, and I read everything I could get my hands on. But really, no one on either side of my family had a background in music or anything else. My sister, when she was, I don't know, maybe 10 or so, took piano lessons, and I wanted to take piano lessons. But that was not something a boy should waste his time on. This, this would be your father speaking. That's I'm right. Yeah. So I was not permitted to, to learn anything about music, even though, again, it's something that I love. And, and uh, so in that sense, it, I had this enormous deficiency. Um, going to university, I mean, I went to Acadia University, as I mentioned, which is a, a wonderful transition for me because it's very rural in one sense, and yet it's a very fine university. So all of a sudden I'm exposed to, you know, to really good theater, for example, and loved it. Got involved in acting, and really involved in acting, and, uh, and then also going to concerts and, and things like that. But it was really more when I went to graduate school that the, the photography really took over yeah. again. Yeah. Um, you have a Master's of Divinity, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and your your thesis was on photography as a means of religious expression. That's correct. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that, because that seemed to me to be you linking two things that were very prominent in your life at the time into into one thing. Yeah, well, um, I was at Union Theological Seminary in New York, and my, my undergraduate work was in philosophy, it was my major, and uh, English was, and biology were my minors. So I don't know, I guess I just assumed I'd probably go on eventually and maybe do a PhD in, in some aspect of philosophy or literature. But um, when I was going into Union, uh, like every other entering student, we had to do vocational testing, which I did. And then when the head of the psych department went over the results with me, she said, you know, she said, your profile shows you should be really involved in the arts. Well, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was like <laughs> the proverbial being knocked over with a wet yeah, noodle. No kidding. But I, have, but I have to ask you, just as an aside here, what vocational testing, what do they do? Like, is this just asking you questions about stuff? Well, I filled out a whole bunch of forms and, you know, questionnaires and uh -huh, things okay. like that. Uh, and I guess it was to help direct us, and because we had to go into a, it's a master's program, so, you know, which area of okay. theology, so to speak. So I was in, I, I was in going into a philosophy of religion stream, but I switched it to practical theology because that included all the arts and the performing arts and the visual okay. arts. Right. And so that, that's, in a sense, where yeah. I went. Now, was it, was it during this point, and I have read in a couple of different places in interviews <laughs> you've done over the years and in some of your books as well, you make reference to, um, and I hope I'm getting your name right, but I think it's Helen Manzer. Helen Manzer, yes. right. Tell me a little bit about her because she was kind of, uh, yeah. she was a, a, a key figure in your life. Helen Manns are an amazing woman. She, I was teaching my second and third years in New York. I was teaching at Brooklyn Friends School. And some of the other teachers were avid amateur photographers. And they soon realized so was I. And so they introduced me to their teacher. 
And she was just beginning to do uh, her autumn workshop in my second year there um, at the Brooklyn Y. So the, I enrolled, and there were 15 of us the first night. And she said to each one of us, remember this is a long time ago, yeah. you will buy a Linhoff tripod model whatever, and you will buy a lights ball and socket head for the top, and you will bring it to class next Tuesday night. Even though I had very little money, I went out and bought this, because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Well, I mean, that was, that's a yeah. terrifying story. Yeah, because yeah. what happened was the next week there were 13 of us brought them. Two didn't. She kicked the other two out, and she just said, you know, I don't just, she gave them the deposits and they'll get out. And then she sat down and she didn't open her mouth again until those two people got up and left. And it, it put the fear of God in the rest of us. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the humiliation of having to walk out of that class because you didn't buy the right ball socket for your tripod. Yeah. Wow. So she was a, she was a hard critic, though, wasn't she? It was something she was really, she, she knew visual design. She was really oriented. Uh, rule oriented somewhat, but she insisted on care and she insisted on discipline. And that was the reason for the tripod. There's your subject matter. You look at it and you be careful. And, and it was two years went by before I even made a, a, a single image without the uh, camera being on the tripod. Huh. Um, and by then, I'd learned how to be careful. And I'd learned about lines, and I'd learned about shapes, and I'd learned about textures, and I'd learned about perspective. And so there was nothing casual about that instruction. Yeah. I want to ask you about South Africa. Yeah. Because you have said that when you first went, it was like home. It was, yeah. That, that, which seems peculiar, but explain why that was. Um, I mean, you're growing up here in New Brunswick, you know, <laughs> why does South Africa feel like home? Yeah, well... Um, well, I, I really don't know the answer to that, even though my next trip there is going to be trip number 40. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, the, uh, we all came from Africa to begin with. And I don't know, when I go back there, it's almost as if some of the atoms that were once in my body are back inhabiting it again. And I just feel a sense, yes, this is where I should be. I feel that. I feel it very strongly. Now, um, there's a, it's, there's a difference, say, between living here in the maritime provinces and living in southwestern Africa, Namibia, the northwest corner of South Africa where I go. And here the earth is covered with a very thick quilt of vegetation and many days a, a quilt of clouds and mists and so on. And so the, the soil and the rocks and everything are covered. There, most of the time, the, the earth is stripped clean, and you see the bones of the earth. And there's something quite essential, and I mean, or elemental about it. And another thing is that when you have this vegetative cover over the earth, you have a good sense of the seasons. Time is always passing. The leaves are bigger today than they were yesterday, or they're more withered today. And over there, in, in the Namib, for example, the sun rises and the sun sets, and the sun rises and the sun sets. And you think, I could be living two million years ago. Nothing else has changed. Or maybe it could be two million years in the future. So instead of having this sense of seasonal change, quick passage of time, time stands still. And I feel, in the, I really have a sense of the eternal which I don't get in most of Canada. Yeah. There's a story that you tell, uh, and I, I'm hoping you can remember it, and I hope you can tell it again to me, about uh, a woman that you came across in those early years in, in South Africa uh, who went on to become, as you've said, a, a very fine photographer herself over the years, and in fact I think she even teaches with you, but at the time that you met her, uh, she was not, and she wasn't very happy with you either. Can you tell me that story? <laughs> um, well, on my third trip, or fourth trip to southern southern Africa, I I went to Namaqualand, which was a very remote part of South Africa in those days, the extreme northwest corner, and um, everyone said it's got the most fabulous spring flowers in the world, and 
I was able to do a bit of research and knew this to be the case every spring, an, an enormous number of species. So I just determined to go. And the first, I went <clears throat> and with a, a chap who I knew from Johannesburg, and we went together, and about the third day we were in this very remote, remote location. We didn't have any plans. We were just getting accommodation wherever we could. Right. And it got to be four in the afternoon. We were photographing these incredible flowers, but the, we, they were past their prime. We were late. And so I said, well, we better get some accommodation. I don't know where we're going to sleep tonight. And he said, there's a little hotel back there. So anyway, we went back to this little hotel. And the owner of the hotel, I mean in nine rooms, we got the last room. And the owner of the hotel, Kala Swat, decided to show her slides that night, first time in her entire life she'd shown any slides. And she took one film a year. She thought, everyone thought, well, shooting pictures are total extravagance. So anyway, but there was a group of people up from Cape Town who had come to see flowers, but the fl someone had got sick, so they were going to have to turn around and go back. So she was showing her pictures for them. So in the eat calm, or the dining room, after dinner, she pro started projecting on the wall. Well, the slides were absolutely god-awful. But <laughs> the subject matter just blew me away. I mean, it was incredible. I mean, flowers such as I'd never seen, couldn't believe. So anyway, and she was apologizing for the picture. She was blaming her camera, not herself. There's nothing wrong with the camera. So anyway, after the uh, dinner, I went out into and got, for, got from my luggage. I had one copy of my book, Photography of the Art of Seeing. So I took it into her, and I said, Mrs. Swat, thank you for your slideshow, etc. And this book may help you with some of your problems. I didn't tell her I'd written the book. Anyway, the next morning I'm sitting, and I'll never forget, in the, again in the little hotel, I know exactly where I was sitting, I was eating a smoked kipper. And the door bursts open and she comes storming in and she said, you're a professional photographer and do I have a bone to pick with you? And I said, what, 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 you know, and she said, you sat through my slideshow last night and she said, I am mortified. That, that you didn't tell me that you were professional. And I said, look, that's not a problem. I love looking at seeing these incredible flowers. So anyway, she said, look, if you can stay for two days, I'm going to take, I'm going to quit everything I'm doing for two days, and I'll take you to the best flowers we have left this year, and you'll teach me all you can teach me in two days. So I said, it's a deal. So we started up the mountain pass behind the hotel right after breakfast. I'd shot four rolls by the time, a film, by the time we got to the top. And she thought I was out of my mind. I mean, and she shot her two remaining pictures for the year on her roll, and then she didn't have any more, so I gave her a roll of film. She couldn't believe that someone would give her a roll of film. So that's how it all began. Wow. One of the things that I think is really interesting uh, uh, about not just your photography, but photography in general. And I want to ask you about this because, uh, um, as I said to you, you've, you've, on this trip to your house, you've met my daughter who's accompanying me, and she just did a photo workshop in Italy for a week. And, and uh, one of the terms that the photographer, Peter Turnley, who's been on this program in the past, used over and over again was making pictures, not taking yes, pictures. Right. And it was interesting because that very phrase comes up in your book and, in fact, in a number of your books and interviews that you've done. It's always making pictures. Talk a little bit about the, the concept behind making a picture as opposed to taking a picture. Well, I like to think a photographer, first of all, begins with the world. Unlike a painter, you can't photograph something that's purely imaginary. You begin with something out there, some subject matter, no matter how much you may change that in the process of making the picture. So it seems to me that that, that subject matter has, in a sense, spoken to me as a photographer. It has affected me in some way. Otherwise, I would have passed it by. So I have a responsibility to it in the same way as I have when I'm introduced to somebody. If I just say, oh, hi, and walk away, that person would genuinely rightly feel slighted, ignored. Well, subject matter, I think, should be treated the same way. In other words, if something has spoken to you, give it the time of day. Spend time with it, look at it, observe it, feel it, 
try and even figure out why it's affecting you the way it is. So what you're doing is you're not just taking something from it, it's, it's like making a relationship. And that's how I think creating most of my photographs is. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the craft work, learning about visual design, learning about lines, learning about shapes, and learning about the equipment one uses. Um, I mean, you do this so you can become fluent in it, just like you can speak French fluently or Spanish fluently or English fluently. But nonetheless, all those things just help you engage in that relationship a little more quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that when I meet people, I never give them the feeling that I'm just, oh, it's a frivolous encounter. And I like to think that the subject matter that I encounter and photograph would feel the same way. Yes. Well, it's interesting when you talk about that because there is, you do tell um, uh, about, and I think this is exemplary of what you're talking about, of an experience you had here once, looking out onto those fields when, and probably at this time of year, when there's right. pre-snow, but everything has gone brown, <clears throat> and having this experience of looking out and suddenly realizing that there was something there was something out there, and you spent a lot of time taking pictures. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I was standing in this house at my kitchen sink, and I was washing dishes and looking out the window, and the field, uh, all the grasses have been smashed down in late autumn storms, and it then snowed and melted some, so there were all of these grasses kind of woven together like this, with a powder of snow over them, and little p bits of black shadow here and there. And I uh, realized, as I was looking out the window, that I'd stopped washing dishes. And I had become fixated on this field. Now, one of the things I know is that everything has, can function, anything, everything can function, possibly as a symbol. So if something transfixed me like that, I thought, okay, what's the pull here? What's going on? <clears throat> so I went and got my camera, and then I went out on the deck, looked at this field, and I started to make photographs. Sections, big sections. Avoiding a line, like a root, avoiding a shape. And I realized what I want is just the weave, the three the, the little blacks, the mid-tone browns, and the whites all woven together in this tapestry. Without having anything in the photograph With, that would draw people's attention to That's it. right. Okay. Yeah, just, you know, so you appreciate the whole thing. So it was not the same anywhere, but it was still terribly integrated. So, and then after about 20 minutes of doing this, I, I realized again I'd become fixated. I was higher than the kite. I was just absolutely dancing. I was euphoric. So again, I said, what's going on? What's going on here? So I came in, made some tea, went back out and sat on a chair on the deck. And you know how sometimes when we want to consider an issue or a problem, and when you sit down and consider it, you'll get the right answer, but you'll march right by? Well, that happened to me that morning. At some point, while I'm drinking the tea, I said to myself, well, the field kind of looks like I'd like my life to look. And I thought, ha, 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 and kept on going. <laughs> And then a couple of minutes later, I said, but it does look you like you'd like your life to be. It looks exactly like your life to be. It's integrated. Well, in 1993, which is when this happened, I was <clears throat> no longer a young man. And I think as we get older and our experiences become more numerous and more diverse, there's this need for integration, this feeling, let's pull it all together. Let's have a, a unity here. And as soon as then as I looked at the field again, I said, that's it. That's what it's suggesting. That's what it's telling me. That's where you want to go. I, I go from that to something else that you've talked about that you tell your students. Uh, and I was thinking of, uh, this came to me as you were describing going out and taking all these pictures of just these, these swatches of this material. You have said to the, to the students in, in your workshops that the most important place for a photographer to be is where they are at that moment. Absolutely. That you can, that it's, it, it's around you wherever you're standing. You don't really have to go looking for material. No, and, and photographers often will say, where's a good place to make photographs? And my reply is, well, you're already there. And, and a couple of things 
I want to say in, in, in response to your question. First of all, in a more general way, personally, I'm never happier than I'm fully present wherever I am. I don't care if it's on the chair on my deck or if it's in the corner of, say, Young and Bloor in Toronto. If I can be fully present, visually, in the auditory sense, just in every way, the sense of the, the, the you know, the feeling, the smells, there is a sense of being fully at home in that place. And, and so that for me is really, really, really important. So the outgrowth of that when it comes to making pictures is if I believe that, then just work with what you believe. And I do. In other words, if you, I might say to you, look, I, I, I'm going to make some pictures. Give me a number between 20 and 50. And you say 36. And I'll say, okay, do you want me to go straight ahead to the left or the right? And you say, to the left. So I'll go 36 steps to the left. I'll put the camera down, the tripod down. And let's say I have a roll of film in the camera, 36 pictures. Every picture will be different from every one other one. But I won't move the tripod, only the camera on top of the tripod or zooming the lens in and out until I have 36 good compositions. Now what happens is 15 is not difficult. 16 is a little more difficult. You get up to 17, it's tough. By the time you get to 21, you're tearing your hair out trying to see something that is fresh and new. And then about 22, 23, or 24th picture, the scales begin to fall off one's eyes. And suddenly it's just, you're there. You're on a whole new plane. And I often say there are about seven shots or six shots between desperation and liberation. <laughs> and you, it really works. And when I'm teaching workshops, I do this exercise. Not 36, but I'll ask one of the participants in the workshop, give me a number, give me which direction, off I go, put the camera down, and I'll quickly just say, <coughs> and show them right here. And, you know, I might have garbage cans here and gravel here, and it couldn't be in many cases, but people think it's less interesting. But the point is to see where you are. Yeah. And if you can do that, you can see it everywhere. We've run short of time for you. Pardon? Uh, we've run short of time. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. I appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>